Great. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Chris Pyle. I'm the president and CEO of Champion Solutions Group and our cloud business unit, Message Ops. Thank you for joining us today. I'm glad and proud to be part of this team here that's going to be presenting uh, the top Windows 10 enhancements and how to address them. I'm here with Dan Powers. Dan, are you on the line with us? I am here, Chris. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. And Dan is our senior engineer of um, desktop uh, security and, and endpoint management. And also really proud to have uh, Chet on the line with us as well from Microsoft. Chet, you out there? I'm here. Can you guys hear me? I hear you just fine, Chet. Thanks for joining us today. Really appreciate it. So uh, everybody, thank you so much. I know there's a lot more people joining on uh, quickly here. Um, so we uh, appreciate it. We're going to start off a little slow here, just uh, going over the agenda. So today, what we're going to be reviewing with you is, you know, really the Windows 10 landscape and what's driving customers to move to Windows 10. And Chet's going to be talking about that. We're also going to be reviewing some of the new obstacles uh, to overcome uh, in regards to this migration. Um, we're also going to address the two types of upgrade paths uh, when considering deploying Windows 10. I think you're going to find that very, very interesting. The other thing that uh, is really new with Windows 10, and we're hearing a lot of people based upon all the business that we're doing, is a huge discussion around BIOS versus UEFI. And we're going to you know, take some uh, questions from you guys. We're going to be talking about that. But it's one of the real interesting things that Microsoft has uh, bundled up uh, into Windows 10. And I think you guys are going to find it very interesting. And we're going to talk quite a bit about that. We're going to talk about the Windows 10 readiness assessment and you know, to help you lay the groundwork uh, for a successful migration to Windows 10. And then we're going to have a slide on what Microsoft funding is available uh, that Microsoft is making out to the community. And we're going to be talking about that. So just some housekeeping here. We have Craig uh, Wilson uh, is one of my uh, cohorts. And he was going to be uh, manning the uh, chat window um, and doing the best that he can to answer questions as we move along um, in the question box of uh, this GoToWebinar. Um, so that's what we're going to be doing. So the first thing we're going to do, just to get a, because we're up to about, oh, God, we're almost 200 attendees on the call here today so far. Um, we're, we want to make sure that we're hitting the right spots and making sure we cover the right uh, you know, topics for everybody. We have three poll questions uh, that we would love to get uh, your, um, you know, your answers on uh, to help us make sure that we hit the mark with our presentation. Um, so the first question is, we're really interested, um, is the first question is, have you moved to Windows 10? We're, we're trying to figure out um, um, if you have moved to Windows 10, yes or no, and, and see how many people are, are you know, that way. So go ahead and please answer those right now. Would we appreciate it very much? So we're about 48% of the people voted so far. Thank you. Give it another second or two. We're up to about 70% of you guys have voted. Okay, we're up to just about uh, almost 80%. Let's get it up to 80%. Let's do this, everybody. One more. Just That's all we need is one more. Okay, fantastic. So where we have right now, uh, we're showing the poll results for that first question. Um, so out of the 200 people, give or take, that are on the phone right now and attending, 61% of you have not moved, uh, and then about 39% of you uh, have moved already or in the process of uh, moving. So that's great. Thank you for your participation. Okay, so the next question, I guess, is really for the 61% of you who haven't moved. Um, when are you planning to move? What is your timeline? Is this something that you're looking to do? Uh, are you planning on moving in the next three to six months, six to 12 months, 12 to 18, 
or 18 months out. And it's going to be, a, you'll find out the reasons why we are asking this for several things as we go through the, uh, the, the, the webinar today. So thank you for uh, participating. Uh, we're up to 50% of you now have voted. Uh, 55, thank you. Uh, fantastic. 57% of you have voted. 58, thank you. Give it another second or two. Yep, let's see if we can get it past 60. And there we go. All right, so let's take a look and publish that. So uh, where are we at here is 34%, which is the biggest group uh, so far, plan on uh, migrating in the next three to six months. Uh, the next biggest group was 30% at 6 to 12, uh, followed by the 25% group, 12 to 18 months, and then uh, the remainder at 11, which is 18 plus months out there. So thank you very much for that. Uh, and then the last question uh, is just, again, trying to get a size of the 200 plus people that we have on the call today. What size organization or how many desktops uh, or users do you have out there um, so we can get a feel for you know, the size of the organizations on today's call? We appreciate that very much. Okay, we're at 55% voted so far. Okay, almost there. Man, this is a good question. We've got a lot of people answering this one quickly. So thank you at 75% or 72% rather. And okay, so uh, at 75% voted so far, uh, it seems that the 1 to 500 followed by uh, 1,000 plus users at 38%. And then 501 to 99 is coming into third place. Um, so thank you very much. It really will help us, the, the presenters, uh, on today's call. And I think all of you now you know who you, the brethren uh, participants are and what they are looking like. Um, so thank you very much. And uh, so really, very uh, much of an honor to have uh, Chet on board with us, who uh, really works with Windows in the enterprise. Uh, Chet, thank you so much for joining us today and uh, giving us Microsoft's perspective on, you know, really why, what are the big drivers, uh, and we are seeing so many people compared to operating systems in the past move uh, to Windows 10 in such a short period of time compared to other OSs, and we're really looking forward to hearing what Microsoft has to say about what are the big drivers uh, that are moving uh, to Windows 10, and why is this being so quickly adopted there, Chet? So welcome aboard, Chet. If you, I'll hand it over to you, and let, let's go from there. All right. Thank you, Chris, and thanks, everyone, for joining the call today. We're extremely excited to have you. Uh, as Chris mentioned, my name is Chet Devchand, and so as the title slide shows, I'm a business solutions professional at Microsoft, and so what does that mean? Um, so I'm, I'm focused on the Windows 10 channel strategy across the entire United States, so I work with partners like Champion Solutions Group, like your, your general ISVs, like other partners that we have from a Citrix uh, AirWatch perspective to ensure that within our Windows 10 ecosystem, um, U.S. customers that give us feedback on what's working with Windows 10, what isn't working, that our, uh, our entire partner organization from the, the ISVs and, uh, and SIs that I referenced um, can all be in lockstep and unified in driving towards the, the needs that you all have within the market. And so if we, if we dive in and go on to the next slide, Chris, um, that's the source of where this conversation essentially stems from, having these discussions with customers. What are the big, big drivers of customers moving to Windows 10? And partners like Champion um, have, have great insight into this. So working through this list, working through conversations we've had with customers, um, letting the cat out of the bag, you can see the three major reasons as to why customers are mi migrating to Windows 10 from requiring enhanced security within their enterprise environment, um, waiting until Windows 10 was deemed, in, in many customers' eyes, having a, a stable, op being defined as a stable operating system. And then uh, w when you look at this from, from a higher level, from an executive level, uh, these digital transformation initiatives, these initiatives that drive uh, business growth and uh, optimize operational efficiencies, Windows 10 can play a huge part in that. And it's, it's, the, it's the third major reason as to, to what customers are looking um, towards, building towards. Now, there's also a fourth major reason. It, I was gonna, I was gonna leave it a surprise, so it's not on the slide. I want to give folks a few, uh, a few minutes to just enter it in, or a few seconds rather. 
uh, to enter it into the chat window, so feel free to do so. Uh, but there is a fourth major reason. It's, it's going to be fairly obvious. And so uh, to share that, uh, I think many of you seem to have guessed it on the chat window. Uh, it, comes to, it comes to bear with the, the hardware refresh. Many organizations that we're talking to are up for that hardware refresh. And when you're looking at Windows 10 and the capabilities that it can provide from a security perspective, uh, new hardware in, in many instances can be required. So uh, throughout today's discussion, we're going to see where and when that, that may or may not be the case, or at least some of that information can be surmised. Um, now, as we're looking through why customers are migrating, we're talking about these three major reasons, the enhanced security. Um, a, a lot of these different discussions, the why is really going to depend on the what. And I know that uh, based on Chris's poll, it seems like 39% of you are already migrated over to Windows 10. So this might be old hat for you and, and somewhat familiar. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to cover what Windows 10 was all about. What's the premise of, of what Windows 10 um, is baked in from a feature perspective as to why all of these certain functionality makes sense. And so uh, to start out, when we think about what the landscape looks like from a security perspective, I think all of you have been involved in some form or fashion, either through friends or colleagues, or you've watched on the news uh, what's going on from a cybersecurity standpoint within the industry today across all verticals and across all different types of customers, whether you're uh, the Hollywood Presbyterian Medical Center in, in Los Angeles, California that was hit with a ransomware attack just over a year ago, or whether you're the, the Pennsylvania Senate Democratic Caucus that was hit with a very similar attack just this past weekend. Uh, no, no matter the types of organizations, no matter the visibility, hackers are after money in many instances. And so uh, with that in mind, many organizations are looking at building uh, a security strategy that's, that, that's developed in a, in, a, in a depth manner and across multiple sets of technologies. And Windows 10 is core, um, is core to that. And so when we look at what's going on, uh, it, it's estimated from a security analyst that uh, when hackers do penetrate your network, they're there for at least 200 days. Uh, when you think about the attack that, that occurred on Sony just over just about two years ago, uh, the, the hackers that penetrated Sony's environment were in the network for estimations show from the FBI about over a year. So um, in, in having that time, to penetrate Sony's environment, they were able to steal just under 100 terabytes of data and make all of that content free uh, and, and available to for the for the public to see. So um, that's definitely the number one reason why we're seeing customers migrating over to Windows 10. Um, when we then look over at you know the security is obviously going to be a great uh, a great requirement for organizations, but we think about what it is that end users are going to require and making sure that you as IT that's providing the service is doing so in a fashion that's stable and doing so in a fashion that your end users aren't going to throw a riot, if you will. And so uh, w last year in July timeframe, we released the anniversary update um, uh, for Windows. It was, the, it was what we essentially deem or what many in, in the industry deem as Service Pack 1. And so I think anyone here who's done w desktop deployments in the past, uh, you probably have the same perspective when you upgraded to XP or you upgraded to migrated to, to Windows 7. You didn't do so until Service Pack 1 came out. And so with the release of Service Pack 1 or anniversary update for Windows last July and then the inclusion of, of anniversary update into our current branch for business deployment cycle, we've seen that a lot of customers uh, have taken towards um, uh, migrating over to, to Windows 10 in that regard. And so if we're looking at the numbers over the last six months, we've had three times as many deployments in this time period of the last six months than at any point um, you know, in, in the Windows 10 release cycle. So uh, that makes no surprise that some of you did, did select that within the three to six month time frame that you're looking to deploy. Yeah, Chet, I would just like to comment on that as uh, you know, Windows 10 and Microsoft Integrator, we uh, agree 100%. We had a lot of customers out there waiting for that anniversary update, that first service pack deployment, and uh, we've definitely seen a, a much, much bigger uh, a pickup in that. So I, I would agree with you from a, you know, from a, a channel's perspective as well. Excellent. Um, and, and so along those same lines then, so then when we, when we further into the conversation, we look at the, the, the discussion of how organizations are trying to become more relevant from a digital perspective, how they can enhance their, their end user customer experience, how customers can be more engaged and how they can drive loyalty um, using different digital technologies. And so this conversation expands into a lot of marketing, a lot of marketing segments, but truthfully, when we're looking at Windows 10, that ability to interface with end customers in a secure fashion is absolutely critical. And, and so when customers are looking, when you think of 
uh, when you think of Hardee's, you think of restaurant chains that are using Windows 10 tablets at, at the forefront of how customers can engage with them and, and, and automatically pick up or, or make orders uh, for their systems. Um, Windows 10 doesn't want, you don't want Windows 10 to be that new threat vector uh, allowing um, uh, nefarious hackers to, to penetrate your network. So uh, digital transformation can be an impetus and we've seen it quite a bit as to why uh, the discussion uh, pivots towards Windows 10. Uh, but all of these different, all of these different uh, reasons as to customers migrating all have to flow uh, with, within each other. So you go from digital transformation to making sure you have a secure foundation. And so um, these all play off of each other quite well. And so Chris, if we go over to the next slide and we look at understanding that what, why customers are migrating over to Windows 10, I would then like to, to, to transition into what is Windows 10. And so I know many of you, this might be, this might seem like it's uh, familiar territory for you, so I won't spend too much time on this and I'll, I'll, I'll keep it somewhat high level. Uh, but, you know, thinking about the, the, the drivers for what was created for Windows 10. Why is it that Windows 10 is considered to be a, 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 a completely revolutionary operating system within the Microsoft framework and, and within, our, uh, within the operating system um, uh, market altogether? All and so there are really three, three key drivers that you would expect Windows 10 is, is, is fighting towards as our North Star. Uh, the first one I think many of you would probably guess is going to be security. Windows 10 is is just a complete new step rate improvement in security. You look at Windows 7 and the functions that are built in, and it, it was a really good operating system for its time, but when we're looking at modern security threats and we're looking at the lack of integration from a software and hardware perspective, Windows 7 doesn't compare to Windows 10. Windows 7 is very much dependent from a software perspective on third-party um, software services to provide uh, that large perimeter to prevent hackers from actually coming in. And with Windows 10, we take a completely different approach where we're not only trying to prevent bad guys from coming into our environment, we're not only adding new security locks to, to all the doors, new security locks to all the windows, putting lasers within the house, and then putting a guard at the front of the door to, to vet anyone that's trying to come through. What we're also doing is we're making sure that after the fact, post-breach, should something actually occur, that we can remediate any kinds of I issues that come about. Um, regardless of the situation. And so we do that through a technology called Windows Defender Advanced Threat Protection, which, uh, which I'll touch upon more in, in just a bit. And so um, looking at the two segmentations of Windows 10 to Windows 7, that is definitely uh, what was major drivers to what we were building towards with Windows 10. And the, this functionality that you see on the screen when you're thinking of capabilities like Windows Hello, where you can log into your computer using biometrics, using facial recognition, I iris scanning, uh, require specific hardware. Uh, you think of the discussion we're going to have today with UEFI. There's going to be a, a, a hardware dependency. And that's not to say that you have to upgrade to, to use Windows 10, but to really maximize the capabilities from a security perspective, there's going to be some, um, some hardware integration that's going to be required. And it's going to be best beneficial, obviously, um, for your organization. Now, the second major reason for customers migrate, the second major reason for, for why we, what was what was behind Windows 10 development um, was the ease of migration and making it more simple for end users, making it more simple for IT to deliver a, a service model uh, that was easy for you to, to have to get your organization onto Windows 10. I know many of you went through the troubles of migrating uh, your computers from Windows XP to Windows 7 and I can tell you first off on, on behalf of Microsoft, we're very sorry for that. I mean it was uh, it, it was really a tough migration. It was hugely expensive. Uh, it's estimated that it costs around two thousand dollars per PC to migrate each PC to from Windows XP to Windows 7. And so with Windows 10, we completely kept that in mind to make sure we can help minimize some of that cost. Now it's not completely minimized. Uh, we're looking to cut that deployment cost in half uh, through technologies like device provisioning and integration with cloud technologies like Azure Active Directory. And so that's definitely at the forefront of, of what we're trying to do so that as we evolve and this anniversary update with the latest release, we've got creators update coming in um, in the next month or two. You're going to see enhancements from a migration and update perspective that's going to make your jobs easier to deliver a service um, to your end users. And then uh, the last focus area is what we, what we focus on is Windows as a service. Windows is not just going to be the typical deployment methodology that you've generally followed over the past few years. Uh, Windows is going to be more continuously developed 
so that new features are provided biannually. Features are going to be provided twice a year with monthly updates providing security and bug fixes and so on and so forth. Um, but with that integration, that allows your organization, especially when you look at trying to provide an, uh, an enhanced customer experience, providing new features on, an, on, on, on a, a more regular basis so that you can keep your, um, you can keep your customers loyal to whatever brand it is that, that you're um, involved in. So Chris, can we go to the next slide, please? So what is the uh, what is the actual momentum that we see with Windows 10? I mean, obviously, just based on the numbers that that Chris shouted out, it sounded like close to 60 percent. Chris, if you can share those numbers again from the poll as to how many customers are looking to migrate in the next six months or 12 months, all up. Yeah, um, I don't have them right in front of me. I have to pull those all back up again. But oh, no problem. I, what I was <laughs> I was really not thinking what Gartner said that 80 percent of the enterprises will run uh, Windows 10 by 2018. Uh, but it, it looks like uh, the number one was 34% of the people that uh, surveyed said they were going to move three to six months, and then the other 30% said six to 12 months. So there's 64% of the people that answered the poll are going to be moving between the next three to 12 months. Uh, so maybe Gartner's right, uh, get, you know, maybe pretty close. Yeah, I mean, from numbers that we're seeing, as I mentioned, the last six months have provided three times as many deployments as we've seen all up on, on Windows 10 than any other period. And so um, I have faith in that number. If it's not 80%, it'll probably be 79.9%. I mean, it's going to come darn close just based on the numbers that we're seeing. And, and year to date, you're looking at around 450 million devices that are running Windows 10 with 30% of those, um, well, 30 million of those devices coming from the enterprise. So there's absolutely you, momentum with, with Windows 10. You said 450 million? Is that what you said, Chet? Yep, 450 million devices running Windows 10 today. Of course, that includes the consumer space, but 30 million are from the enterprise. And you know, diving in deeper, we've got about 95% plus of our enterprises that we're engaged with involved in proof of concepts or pilot. So um, the momentum is definitely shifting for that 80% target by 2018. I think the one thing that really blew me away, and I think a lot of the others, was how uh, a lot of the government, uh, you know, facilities, uh, you know, were really taking the lead where you, they used to be the laggards. Um, but uh, that was one of the things uh, that I noticed. And I think one of your slides, I think it might be the next one. Yeah, here it is. Talks about you know what the Defense Department is doing. Yeah, and you know that's a really good transition. So when you know we're talking about why the Defense Department was so uh, was so quick to jump on deploying Windows 10, you're looking at four million seats that are supposed to be deployed by the end of this year. Um, and you think of what's been going on with Russia relations over the last year and hacks that have purportedly occurred. Um, as a staunch loyalist, as a staunch nationalist and patriot, uh, a patriot of the United States, I can't tell you that. Uh, how proud I am of Windows 10 being deployed within the government agency because knowing the technology that's being deployed, knowing the iteration that we're providing from a security perspective, uh, this to me at least quells any concerns that I would have for how our operating systems are being secured um, with, within our, our government agencies. And so uh, the, the, the big thing that you'll see in this slide is it's, it's not only a Windows 10 conversation. Uh, the, the other article on the right-hand side of the slide, eWeek, shows that Microsoft won a, a one point, that's close to a $1 billion services engagement to, to help deploy Windows 10 in our DoD environment. But more than just that, it also includes cloud services. And so when you're looking at how you can provide security in depth and how you can integrate and ensure from a multi-factor authentication perspective when you're thinking of leveraging cloud technologies to be more nimble, how you can um, tie in all these technologies together, uh, that's what Windows 10 provides. It's not just a single pin, uh, a single point in place operating system. It's a cloud-enabled operating system that ties into uh, other Microsoft technologies like Azure Active Directory. And so the next slide, if you move over, will help explain that and provide a little bit more credibility as to what it is we're, we're talking about there. Um, so uh, within our, our security infrastructure um, at Microsoft, I think many many folks on the phone will probably think, well, who's Microsoft? I mean, Microsoft has never been a security company, and nothing could be further from the truth moving forward. We are absolutely a security company. We invest one billion dollars in security, in one billion dollars in R and D security on an annual basis. And uh, when you look together across all these different product sets for Office 365, Advanced Threat Protection, 
Um, all of these technologies come together to provide us an intelligence graph, what we call our intelligence security graph, so that we can collect information in a big data format, store it in our Azure cloud that's completely anonymized, and help provide better services to our customers. So when you think of the numbers at scale, we collect, we scan 200 billion emails across Outlook and across Office 365 in terms of what goes through advanced threat protection for Office 365. We, we scan 300 billion user authentications a month. We update 1 billion uh, Windows devices um, in, for, for security purposes. And, and with our, our, our search engine, which I'm not sure many people on this line use, but has 23% market share in Bing, uh, with our search engine, we're scanning around 18 billion pages uh, a month. And so all of that information that's collected is then put into a huge database, it's analyzed, and it's shared across all of our teams in Azure, Xbox, Outlook.com, our Office 365 team. And so when you compare what we're able to do at scale and how we're able to prune down all that information that you would do with your team, uh, this is what we're able to do because of our uh, because of the, the, the vectors of investments that we have. So uh, I want to at least throw it out there that we are completely a security company. I'm sorry, was there something you were going to say? No, it's just very impressive the amount of data that you collect amongst all of your different properties and you know how you bring it all in and you know be, being able to analyze all of that. It's uh, pretty damn impressive. Yeah, and so looking at how it all comes together, just as an example, I, I know I'm running short on time here, um, we think of we think of ransomware as, as the, uh, the the hot new attack uh, mechanism that's using that's being used by hackers. In the last 12 months, the number of ransomware variants has has doubled, has more than doubled. And so, to help address this threat, you've got technologies like um, Office 365 Advanced Threat Protection. So, before we even get into that technology, this this huge database of, of information that we have in in ISG, our Intelligence Security Graph, um, we provide this layered level of defense so that the the intelligence security graph can help provide a screening for Office 365 ATP to identify where these where these um, uh, general attacks are coming from. But you know that's just something that we're driving at scale, so it's not going to be 100 perspective. And so the next line of defense to help prevent these these ransomware attacks from coming through is is going to be built into our our edge browser and will and will hopefully be applied across um, an application virtualization level of other browsers in what we call um, Windows Defender Application Guard, so that you can virtualize your browser as an application. And so when a user clicks on their email um, in their browser, that, that virtualized application won't be able to affect the operating system. It won't be able to affect the network. It won't be able, able to have access to any other data. And so you can containerize um, what any kind of damage that would be done within uh, a virtual sandbox, essentially. And so if, if uh, if, if, if a user is not using that technology, then we've got a third line of defense in what's built into um, the Windows 10 stack across the, the technologies that you're seeing in front of you. And so across all of our technologies with, within Windows 10, we take a pre-breach and post-breach approach so that we can protect the device, we can protect the identity, and we can provide um, threat resistance and, and encrypt your data. Um, what I do want to point out on this slide as well is that of all the technologies you see here, the only ones that are used in Windows 7 is Smart Screen and Firewall and BitLocker. And so everything else is going to be value-added gains to, to a migration towards Windows 10. And so with that, what I would like to do is, um, if, if Chris, if you have any other questions or comments, um, I'd like to pass it over to Dan, but let, let me know if anything else comes through the chat window. Okay, we'll let you know. I appreciate that, chat, And um, I know that Craig is answering as many questions as he can. Uh, in the chat window, he might need some assistance, uh, but he's doing as well as he can. And and for those of you um, who haven't gotten your questions answered, uh, we'll get back in touch with you uh, as soon as possible. So, uh, Chet, fantastic overview from Microsoft's perspective. We do appreciate that. Uh, next up uh, you know, is uh, Dan Powers, and again, Dan uh, is our champion uh, endpoint security engineer. Uh, has a lot of Windows 10 uh, migrations underneath his belt, and he's going to be talking about which road to take and how to get there uh, on your Windows 10 deployment, and uh, going to be real interesting and looking forward to uh, talking with you. So, Dan, are you on? I am here, Chris. Well, welcome, Dan. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start the slide, and I think the first thing was the new obstacles that need to be overcome here. Um, from you know your perspective and what you're seeing you know, 
compared to the Windows XP to Windows 7 uh, up to the Windows 10 here, Windows 7 to Windows 10. So what, 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 you, what is this slide telling us here, Jen? Yeah, well, like I said, Chris, the first slide you had before, I think um, from the polling questions we have and so forth, we know Windows 10 is inevitable in everybody's environment. I think a lot of people still realize and feel that XP to Windows 7 move, and in some cases that was a long and lonely road. Uh, what we're trying to do is, is with partnering with Microsoft, is to make that road a little bit shorter and a little bit easier to travel with you, right? Um, and the only way to do that is to make sure that everybody has an understanding of some of the obstacles, some of the obstacles options that you have um, and get a real understanding of what your current environment is so you can achieve what, what we like to call a desired state. But what this uh, slide is showing you, Chris, is I grabbed a piece from Chet's um, slide deck there that, that highlights that approximately 2K per, per PC of upgrading from Windows XP to Windows 7. Um, and that was from a Gartner report, I think it was 2014, right, during that whole migration phase. Um, and those were the numbers they came out with. Some of the things that I want to show you that are, that are new obstacles uh, that might affect you in, in this adoption uh, that might not have affected you during Windows XP to Windows 7 is, of course, 64-bit applications. Uh, a lot of folks did in-place upgrades, which we're going to talk about in a minute, right? They kind of did an in-place upgrade from XP to Windows 7, or they got new hardware. They really weren't so concerned uh, at the time are they a 64-bit or 32-bit operating system? Uh, we fast forward a few years now, and what we're seeing is a lot more applications are now written 64-bit. The vendors are trying to uh, basically end-of-life 32-bit applications. There's better performance in that stuff, but just the fact that they're going to that 64-bit application space. And if your OS is not 64-bit, you obviously can't run the 64-bit the applications on it. Um, so that's one of the obstacles that you're going to see right, with, with your choices here. And of course the other one that you alluded to before is that BIOS to UEFI. Um, to take advantage of some of those things that Chet pointed out that are security features inside of Windows 10, do rely that you have the system booted in what's called UEFI mode, or the, it's the Universal uh, Extension Flexible Interface, right? Firmware Interface, excuse me. Um, and what that allows us to do is overcome a lot of the limitations that traditional BIOS gave us today. So I, I didn't want to dive too much on this unless you want to ask a couple of questions. Uh, we have a lot of this information on our website, and if people aren't aware of what it is, uh, please ask a question. We'll try the best to answer it. But a couple key points I did want to point out was this is not a Windows 10 thing. This is not even a Microsoft thing. This is really a vendor consortium uh, started by Intel. And uh, the Mac, Macintosh machines have been adopting and using UEFI since 2006. Um, but again, those features, a lot of those features of uh, secure boot, measured boot, device guard, anti-malware, early protection and that stuff relies on UEFI being enabled, right? So you need to understand that in your environment today. So for they, right. So so at the next slide, and the reason I bring that up is as you're looking at the Windows 10 adoption, you have choices. Uh, you can do the in-place upgrade, which which a lot of people are probably used to today. Whether you walk around with a DVD, you do it over the network, whatever your method of delivery is, the pros to the in-place upgrade is quite honestly it's faster and easier to perform. You don't have to deal with the user migrations. You don't have to deal with the software per se, um, and it's less expensive, Chris, simply because of the man hours. Uh, the cons to that, of course, is if I'm a 32-bit operating system, I can't magically switch over to 64-bit in an in-place upgrade. And that means my OS is stuck back at 32-bit, and of course, like I had mentioned, I can't run 64-bit applications. We also can't make that move from BIOS to UEFI um, with an in-place upgrade, and we can't take advantage of secure boot and so forth. What we also notice in some of the clients that we dealt with is if they've had machines in their environment for over a year, I'd say, um, they may have hard drive problems, they may have installed software or so forth. Uh, they may have just some nuances on the boxes and an in-place upgrade is going to carry those problems forward into the Windows 10 world. Even though Microsoft did a tremendous job in that upgrade process, it's just quite possible that I could carry forward problems that existed before. Your other option, of course, is to do a fresh install. Uh, a lot of the uh, customers that we've talked to really start looking at this fresh install, whether that's, hey, I'm going to get new hardware and I'm going to have it delivered with Windows 10 UEFI enabled and so forth, or they're simply going to look at their existing hardware, understand that they still have life cycle, right, life uh, uh, cycle ability on the hardware itself, it's not end of life yet, and they want to basically do a fresh install. What that means is we're going to wipe out the hard drive and we're going to freshly install Windows 10. 
of course, what does that give us from the pro's perspective is I can switch from 32-bit to 64. Of course, once I do that from the OS, my applications can be migrated over to 64-bit. I can do that switch to BIOS to UEFI, and of course, now I can start taking advantage of all those beautiful features in Windows 10 from a security perspective. And lastly, any existing problems that might be on the machine obviously are removed. The cons to this, of course, is it's a longer process. It can be a manual effort to change some of these BIOSes, right? Uh, it costs more, again, just from a manual perspective. And we have to redeploy software. Some cases we want to because we want to move from 32-bit to 64, but if I wipe the hard drive, this is just something I have to do. And I also obviously have to back up and restore that user state, what makes that machine Chris Pyle's m machine, for example. So yeah. these are just, you just really need to understand that these are the issues that you're going to be facing within the choices that you have to make. So Dan, got just a few questions or and maybe some clarification here uh, first. I mean, going under the, the, the pros of the fresh install, you know, for those who might not be familiar with the terminology, can you just review secure boot and measured boot? Uh, sure. So, so secure boot is is really um, the idea that it's you're, you're creating a root of trust. Okay, it's the same way that uh, electronic. Uh, money works today. Uh, the best analogy I can probably make is everybody out there probably has a smartphone, whether you have an Android or you have an Apple device. And if you heard the terms rooted or jailbroken, yeah, uh, my kids that's do that. Yeah. <laughs> well, what what it means, Chris, is basically you have to start with a root of trust, something that everybody trusts, right? Um, when when the the Android device boots up or that iPhone boots up, there's there's that little firmware piece that you can't write to, it, you can't flash it like you can BIOS and those other things. It starts up, does a health check, and says I have not been tampered with, and he starts loading the rest of the hardware and then turn around and load it into the OS, and he develops this chain of trust all the way up the tree. Um, um, that basically says you can trust what's on me now, right? That, that nobody modified anything. And just FYI, that's where a lot of those, uh, what used to be called rootkits, they still exist, obviously, rootkits, those persistent attacks that even if your antivirus, you know, whatever you're running, detects it, tries to clean it, you reboot your box and it comes back, right? That's why they called it persistent. It hid down in that BIOS. It hid in that master boot record. Um, that, that secure boot is basically saying everything that loads up from the hardware and the firmware perspective all the way to the OS is going to be digitally signed. Basically, this has not been modified. This driver from Intel, this driver from Microsoft, whatever that happens to be, is digitally signed. Nobody tampered with it. There's no uh, malware here. You can trust me, basically, is what it's saying. So Secure Boot is taking the entire system all the way to that level. Measure Boot allows you to uh, create a channel, if you will, that let's say a kiosk machine or an ATM or something like that, where a certain channel of software and stuff goes up through that trusted chain. And basically what I'm saying is I trust that at this point everything that's running on here is exactly what I wanted to have running. And back to Chet's point, one of the reasons the government and so forth looked at and adopted Windows 10 because of all those attacks, all those viruses, all that malware coming out, this again is just a, another layer of defense that you want to put in um, from your security posture, right? Got it, got it. Okay, well, so basically what I'm seeing here is while it's, while the in-place upgrade uh, is faster and easier, the reality of it is, is you're not getting what you're paying for because of the limitations of not being able to deploy the uh, the secure boot, the UEFI, and you know, the, uh, and taking advantage of the hardware with different uh, SSDs and the 64-bit applications in the EOS. But the reality of it is, we're still seeing people do the in-place upgrades rather than uh, the fresh install because of your cons that you put down there. And I think what we're going to talk about next is how have we helped our clients, uh, you know, do a fresh install but without so much pain and manual effort. I think that's what we're going to be talking about next. Isn't that right, Dan? That, absolutely, right? And, and one of the other things I wanted to point out there, we are talking a lot of security, but just realize BIOS itself, right, has been around since the early 80s, back when I had an Atari game console, right? Now, BIOS updates have occurred and all that good stuff, but the fundamentals of how BIOS works has not changed, right? So UEFI was long overdue. And just to keep in mind, even beyond that uh, security features is 
the, the newer security features, the newer maintenance will, will all exist under UEFI. For example, out of band management, right? Being able to manage your systems when there's no OS on it. Those features are coming out today. It'll all be based on UEFI. But back to, back to answer, back to your question is there are a lot of cons with moving that. We noticed clients were still kind of doing that in place upgrade. Um, what we are trying to do with Microsoft's help, of course, is as I had mentioned, make that road smaller, make it an easier journey. And if we could automate this, we could design uh, achieve your desired state and I think anybody going through this process of a Windows 10 adoption this is not just a one-off weekend thing we're gonna do it's a project it's probably budgeted it's in the you know the years projects do it right the first time um, and I think what you really want to look at is if you want to run Windows 10 you want to be 64-bit, right? There's no reason to be at 32-bit. Um, you want to switch over to UEFI for all the security reasons we mentioned. And again, you want to be in a position to take advantage of the rest of the things that UEFI will bring you uh, because this is a destructive process. And I don't want to a year from now say, oh, you know what? I, I, you know, the, the regulatories are coming down on me, by the way, which we see in healthcare and finance, they're getting tighter and tighter, or just internal regulations where the folks are coming and saying, hey, this is the standard you have to reach. You know, I have to patch my machines the next times. I have to close these security holes. By the way, your new perimeter is every endpoint in your environment, and they have to have these security features. And at some point, they're going to be listing these things like secure boot, and if you're not there today, you're going to have to redo this process. You're kicking the can down the road, right? So what, because, and because this is a destructive process, what we did at Champion is, is automate this part, right? So we automated this. We took the manual side out of it. We're going to show you some stuff coming forward that explains a little bit of what we did and in the end result for the customers that we worked with that we were actually able to achieve their desired state much faster than they thought um, and, and at, a, at a less cost to them as well just because of that manual effort. Right. Okay, great. So it all starts off really, I guess, by uh, understanding what they people have today at the end of the day. I think that's the basis of it all, I think, right, is the beginning. You have to, exactly. So first of all, it's understanding, and again, Chris, for folks on the phone, we've dealt with companies at 100 machines, and as you know, Chris, we've, we've talked to folks that had 40, 60, 70,000 endpoints, and when we start talking about all the features of Windows 10 or UEFI, um, it didn't matter if they were that small company or the big company. They didn't know and understand every option, so I think that education is there. After that, exactly right. Now that I know what my options, do I do an in-place, do I do an upgrade, you have to start looking at things like, well, what operating systems are you running in your environment today? On that, what are your hardware vendors? Do I have, am I all Dell, am I HP, do I got a mix of everything out there? And when you start getting into the nitty gritty, because if we think about switching to UEFI, I might have to deal with your BIOS and update them, right? When's the last time that everybody said, hey, we're going to update everybody's BIOS. It's just not something you did all the time. You need to know what uh, models you have, what the vendor models are, what is supported for your desired state. And that's exactly what we're going to see next is we develop these tools to go out, get this data in real time, and deliver it to you so you have a great understanding of your environment. Uh, again, those BIOS versions. Hey, I got all these machines. I know I can move them. Here's a whole set of machines that I have to go flash the BIOS. And by the way, we can automate that as well right, to get to your desired state, but it's just a step, it's a little problem that you have to overcome in this journey. Um, also, your installed applications, right? Now, hopefully everything's going to work under Windows 10, but of course you might find some that are not certified. Well, then I have to do extra testing on these. Um, if I get a list of all your apps and I can certify them that these will run under Windows 10, you know, from this version up, we're safe, we kind of know that. And I'm also going to find applications that may be questionable, right? Uh, some of the other interesting things we found and we added to this, if you notice that warranty information. Um, Chris, why do you think the warranty information was important? Well, I think it's really important on the warranty information because you might be coming up in, in your you know, purchasing life cycle, you might be doing hardware refreshes at the end of the warranty periods, and you don't want to be doing a bunch of work if you're going to be replacing the equipment anyway. Or maybe you still have three years left on the warranty, and you're still in the, in the beginning of your depreciation cycle, and you need to go ahead and you know, do something with it because you're going to be holding on to that piece of equipment for a while. 
absolutely nail on the head. You don't, you don't want to spend time migrating a bunch of pieces of equipment that you know, hey, in a month from now, I got to order new hardware. They're at the end of life. So we started adding that information in, right? Um, and on the flip side, uh, we, we've hit customers who said, hey, we may do this, and you know what? We're just going to do it as the systems need to be replaced from a hardware perspective. And that's fine, but if you got, Chris, if you're a hospital, if you're a financial institution, and you've got a 1,000 endpoints out there that are not end of hardware life cycle for two years, um, you certainly may get the regulatory committee or even internal coming to you and say, you have to reach the, these compliances in the next six months. And guess what? You can't wait until you do the hardware refresh. So you want that information at your fingertips. And, and as an added bonus, I threw in there just a recent one that we did. We were migrating folks, um, and then we started realizing in this particular environment, they've had PCs that multiple people use, let's say a nurse's station or something like that. Um, and even, uh, funny enough, it was the IT department that their user profiles were massively huge. And, and we all of a sudden, hey, why is it taking so long to migrate these guys? Because it should be like an hour, right, from st start to finish. Um, they, they had literally gigabytes in their user space of old IS, uh, ISO files and so forth. So we flagged them, right? Hey, we're not going to clean up your machine, get rid of this stuff, we'll migrate your user state so you save all your bookmarks and documents. I'm not migrating every ISO you ever had for the last 20 years type thing. Right. Yeah. So again, I want that information at my fingertips. Right. So we gather all this, uh, and we're going to be talking a little bit about, but we gather all of that pretty quickly. And you were talking about flashing the BIOS, and we can do that, right? I mean, again, hands-free uh, from the user's perspective on how we could go ahead and those that need to have the BIOS updated. That, that, that's correct, and, and I, I will caveat that, right, if it's, there, there might, you might have some real old machines that I can't do that with, anything in the last few years, right, six, seven, eight years, uh, we can run the BIOS flash update uh, with our tool, um, the, the machine does have to reboot, you can notify the user, we can do it all friendly like, but you don't have to walk to the machine and do it with a, with a USB stick, bottom line. Absolutely, right. and then the other thing that we do is we really then are talking about overall compatibility. Right, right. So, so I want to touch a little bit on what we call the desired state, right? So everybody's going to be a little bit different, and in a large organization, you may have multiple desired states. Think about it from a security perspective. Um, I got servers in the DMZ, I got servers behind my firewalls, I got servers in the machine room. They all have a different set of, of what I would call being compliant. Um, your endpoints might be in that same phase, right? For an example, I know Chet threw out there talking about BitLocker. We have clients that looked at and say, hey, for every laptop, we have to have hard drive encryption. Now, if I can leverage BitLocker and not have to buy something new and automate this, perfect, great. Take, take those features out of Windows 10 that are in there in the Windows environment, right? But I might not have to encrypt my servers, right? So that desired state really is from your company's perspective, from where you're trying to get to, let's define that, and what we're able to do in the tool fairly quickly is to adjust these things for the different groups of machines to tell you, are they ready to, to move to Windows 10? Um, and again, if you see some things in here, I highlighted incompatible, but we're checking the basic things. Hey, is the hard drive space, the, the memory, does it, can it just run Windows 10, first of all? But we can add, move, switch things around so that we could represent it for your particular company. And of course, if you look there, we see a bunch of machines that are way out of warranty, and I did that on purpose. <laughs> But at the end of the day, Chris, is exactly that. We, we give you that through the readiness assessment that Champion does provide, right, where we can go out, and I just grabbed some screenshots here, that gives you at your fingertips your environment, and we can do this in a day, right, and it, we're showing you, hey, which machines are already running UEFI, which are in BIOS, which can move to Windows 10, where are your issues, right, where's the applications that I might have issues with and so forth. We can gather all this data because, again, I really truly believe you need to know what your options are, you need to have your current state at your fingertips, you define your desired state, and then we can build that road and that plan to actually get there. And if we do it in an automated fashion, I guarantee we can do it quicker than you expect. Yeah, absolutely, and we've proven that over and over again. The question uh, also is regarding, you know, we're talking about the, the application portability, um, and that we also look at you know, some of the customers that we've worked with, you know, some of them had, you know, over a thousand different applications and understanding which one of those apps uh, will and will not be, uh, you know, uh, compatible for running Windows 10 is also part of the readiness assessment, what we've done and how we, you know, how we really acknowledge how difficult this migration might be. 
That, that, that's correct, Chris. So, so what we do is we, we certainly flag and show you, here's all the apps that absolutely are certified, here's all the apps that, that may not be, um, and here's questionable ones. Now, it would be a little bit more digging, right, into those questionable ones, because quite honestly, you, you do have to do some testing, right? So I can't answer that day one, but I could certainly probably hit 90% of your apps and say, you know what, hey, all of these, they're totally cool. And by the way, during our process, if they are running 32-bit versions of them, at the end, at the end of it, we'll make them 64-bit, right? Um, so we're, again, it's it's information. Know where you sit today, so that you have your plan. So Dan, before we get to the last slide here, um, how do we do this? And so we we developed a uh, what we call the shuttle. And can you explain to the listening audience here what is this shuttle, and how does it help us? And you know how intrusive and invasive is the shuttle uh, in somebody's uh, organization. Can you just give a little bit uh, for everybody on how we really help with the whole migration, uh, discovery, assessment, recommendations, and then onward to the implementation and leveraging some of our value add, such as the shuttle? Sure. So, so the shuttle actually didn't come out of the Windows 10 thing. It was just we realized it was a really good match for Windows 10. Um, at, at, again, people might know on the phone. You obviously do, Chris. Champion. We work with a lot of different solutions uh, from security to to virtualization and all sorts of things. What we are and and what we realize, like any vendor, right? We go in and we can do a PowerPoint. We can show you these things. Inevitably, if people are interested in a solution, they kind of want to see it. And we do what's a POC, right? That's usually a long, drawn-out process. You know, oh, we okay, you got to build us a VM. Here's what it has to be. Let's talk to your network database guys, whatever that is. Let's get this running to get this moving. What we did at Champion with the shuttle was try to really cut down that POC time. That's where the shuttle came out of. And all it is is a small little box. It's literally the size of about a DVD player, um, and it's running um, the XXI server, right? So EXXI 6, and we got various VMs that we created with our different business partners, depending on what solution you're looking for, that are pre-configured, kind of ready to go. And what we, we do is we ask to say, listen, we're going to bring this in. We just built it. You can scan it. You can do whatever you want with it. We do need to plug it onto your network. And it would be no different than if I asked you to build me a VM and we got a POC running. Is We're just taking a couple days out of it um, and getting this up and running. We did this for the Windows 10 assessment that, again, we could bring this into an organization. We could plug it in. And, and we deploy some agents to get the detailed data, especially the application data, right, to, to some of your desktops, as many as you want to do. And literally, in a few hours, we're going to have all the data we need. And then it, it automatically removes the endpoint uh, that it installed. Um, we gather the information off so we can produce that readiness assessment report. And if, if the client wishes and if they want to do it, they can snapshot or I don't care if they delete the VM after. Basically, we're walking out of there saying, I'm not taking any of your data with me, right? It was, hey, these things used to take, you know, three, it might have taken a week to get set up you know, logistically, and then we run it for a couple of days. We just took that down to a matter of hours um, is really what the shuttle idea was and why it worked really well with the Windows 10 assessment. Yeah, and we, we, what I've heard in time, in time again is, you know, we've set it up, literally go out to lunch, come back, and we have all the information. So True. it's, uh, it's a, a great, great thing. Um, so, you know, time is money here. So, you know, based upon the success that we've had with some of our, our, our clients, uh, what are we seeing here, Dan? Well, well, again, I want to go back to that idea. If, if people didn't realize, right, uh, stressing that UEFI, right, I, and I think a lot of people probably had handle, hey, I know I want to be 64-bit. Maybe you already did that when you did the uh, Windows 7 piece. Um, but it's that UEFI is really what we're seeing that people either didn't know, uh, weren't prepared for it, and, and again, might have heard about, oh, Secure Boot or Measure Boot or Device Guard. They didn't realize these are dependent on UEFI. Um, and, and that threw a monkey wrench into their plans of, of a Windows 10 adoption because, again, this is a project. This is not a weekend thing I'm going to go do. And they really took a step back and said, we want to do this right. Uh, Again, being able to gather the data, whether it's the shuttle or how we how we do it, that real-time information and understanding what your current state is and understanding where your desired state is to be, we now have a line that we can draw from point A to B. And we've proven through automation, being able to take a machine, define it as, hey, this can move to the Windows 10, and I can automate the process of 
booting that system, having it in, uh, switch to UEFI mode, have it install Windows 10, have it put the proper security settings you want, restore your user state, and restore all of the applications, and even move 32-bit applications to 64-bit many times over lunch, is that we've shown that we can do this uh, 50 to 60 percent faster than what they had currently planned out because it's come, some of the customers that we went to literally had hey this is something we're doing this year this is what we planned out this is how many man hours we think it's going to take this is our effort and we're going to go hire you know some some temp students and stuff to help us do this in, in sneaker net fashion where things don't work uh, we've literally been able to go in and and shorten that down that that 50 to 60 percent honestly Chris is is a low estimate we, we've done it much faster but again I also want to keep uh, you know, realism here is there's change control. Every organization is going to be a little bit different, right? So I'm I'm just very comfortable in saying that because of the automation, we're going to get you to that desired state, and we're going to do it a heck of a lot faster than you think that that we could do, right? Um, and 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 actually, there's there's a particular customer in that other one which I I forgot was even there, right? 7,400 uh, endpoints uh, was an eight man week effort. Um, and they literally were, were planning to do that over an entire year, and we were able to do it in eight man weeks. Yeah, it's fantastic. So I just want to make sure that I understand. So you're, what you're telling the, our audience here is that our, you know, the process and the people that we have and the technology that we've used, we can go ahead and skip the in-place discovery, uh, I mean the in-place upgrade rather, and uh, go to actually wiping the, the, the whole computer clean, saving the user's profiles and the whole desktop and everything that was there, reinstalling it with 64-bit um, with basically uh, hands-free. Is that what you're telling us? Well, absolutely, Chris, but also remember, because if I have that real-time data at my fingertips, if, if I have a machine that's Windows 8, and it's less than a year old, right, and it is already shipped, and it came with UEFI, and basically it's ready to go, I can do that in-place upgrade on that machine. Why? I know what my desired state is. I know the exact state it is in real time, and on those machines... I would actually choose to do the in-place upgrade because because even with our process that will still be quicker, right? But again, I'm making very educated guesses um, because I have all the facts now. But but exactly to your point, those other machines that are older, that are 32-bit, that are you know need BIOS updates, all these things. Yes, we can automate that process from beginning to end. Excellent, excellent. Um, you know, here we're talking, you know, this, you achieve your dire state with automation here. We're basically at 95% compliance. Yeah, yeah, I put this one in here because, again, I, I really believe people, people need to treat this from a perspective of what is my desired state because what we're seeing, especially in healthcare finance and, again, to Chet's point, um, is the regulatory committees are tightening down, right, internal, external. You're going to have these pressures that it's not just going to be, hey, are you running 64-bit? Hey, can you support this application? Hey, have you got the right version of Windows on this? It's going to be your endpoints have to meet these security guidelines or you're going to be in trouble. So that's your desired state. And the reason why I put that compliancy report there is we want something that can enforce and can keep this compliancy state going well after Windows 10 is put into place, right? Perfect example, Chris, is I got laptops and you know what? They have to have hard drive encryption, whether you buy a third-party product, whether you leverage BitLocker, uh, you leverage File Vault on the Mac, I don't care. You want to make sure you're compliant, and those regulatory uh, uh, regulations, external and internal, are only going to get tighter and tighter, and you want to make sure that you're compliant. Excellent. Excellent. Well, Dan, thank you so much. Uh, I know we're coming up on the hour here, but I think the next piece is really imp uh, important. And uh, that is what Microsoft is doing uh, for the organizations that are on the phone here today um, and how they're helping you get started. Um, so the first thing is, if you're interested, there's, uh, and again, I, I want to really highlight that, you know, if you qualify, um, and then there's certain different qualification uh, criteria uh, for each of these that you know we don't want to waste your time with today, but we just want to stress that you have to qualify for these. But there's a four-day uh, uh, security briefing uh, of the new security threats that are out in the marketplace in the landscape, and then how Windows 10 
uh, addresses those. This is completely, uh, this four days is uh, funded with $10,000. Uh, the next, and Lord knows, man, we've been, <laughs> these next two we've been really utilizing a lot of, and that's the Windows 10 uh, POC, uh, where you know, we'll work with you at your side, but not on your payroll, to, hear, to help you in your test environment where you can review the security application compatibility and, t and, and let's test the deployment strategies uh, that Dan was talking about. And that uh, is a five-day proof of concept. Uh, and is $10,000 uh, that Microsoft is funding. And then the last uh, is an enterprise pilot uh, with uh, Windows 10 deployment, planning, design, image engineering, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, Microsoft uh, you know, will be giving up to $50,000 uh, in this uh, uh, enterprise funded pilot. Um, so, you know, Microsoft and Chet, thank you uh, so much for Microsoft and, and, you know, working with message ops in our community here to, to you know, offer these great, uh, you know, funding vehicles to help uh, companies get started uh, down the road uh, with their Windows 10 migration. Um, so thank you for that. Um, the last thing is really next steps. Um, the first thing is we're going to be sending out uh, a replay of this to everybody. Uh, we want, you know, please work with us. Uh, give us a call. Uh, we'll find out if you qualify for the Microsoft funding. We'll get you started. We've been doing this quite a while. We know how to do it quickly. Um, we'll send out, we have a great Windows 10 Resource Center at Champion SG. Uh, dot com forward slash services forward slash Windows 10 upgrade. We'll send this link out, but there's a tremendous amount of uh, information in there. We'll send out the slides. We're also going to be uh, and, you know, pulling a uh, winner for an Xbox for everybody uh, who's joined today, one lucky winner. I'd like to congratulate Jeremy Johnson, um, our previous winner from uh, our last uh, webinar that we had. So congratulations on that one, Jeremy. Uh, but really, uh, you know, in closure here, because we want to be cognizant of everybody's time, we're five after or three after here. Um, Craig, I wanted to thank you. Um, that I know there's been quite a few questions coming in and out. Um, and hopefully you've been doing a good job answering all of those. Um, can we unmute Craig if he has any questions maybe while we're all on the phone here? Um, sure. Let's see. Craig, we're going to unmute you just in case. And maybe we should just unmute the whole audience and see if anybody's got any questions or That's we can't do idea. that. That's not a good idea? Okay. Uh, Craig, Craig Wilson, listen, buddy, we unmuted you. Is there any big questions that are coming in that you couldn't answer that you might want to ask of uh, Dan and Chet? I guess not. Okay. All right. All right. Sounds good. Sounds good enough. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, we appreciate you joining today's webinar. Uh, look forward to uh, the uh, follow-up email, and we look forward to working with you uh, in the field. Chet, thank you for your time. Dan, thank you for your time. Craig, thank you for yours, and I uh, hope everybody enjoys the rest of their week. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.